Welcome to All About Almodovar, an introduction to loving the films of Pedro Almodovar. I'm Ingu King, a critic at The Hollywood Reporter, and today I'm here with my human voice to talk with my co-host, Slate podcast producer Daniel Schrader, with his human voice to talk about Pedro Almodovar's The Human Voice. Hey, Daniel, it's been a while. Hey, so glad to be back. Uh, yeah, I haven't talked to you in such a long time. <laughs> I know. It's, we haven't. We literally deleted each other's numbers until we were able to get screeners for this. So we originally intended for this podcast to be an eight-part series that distills the essentials of Amadovar's four-decade career. But since he has graced us with a new short uh, shot during quarantine with essentially one cast member in just two locations... We decided to add to our series before moving on to our bonus episodes, which will come one day. <laughs> and we'll probably end up recording when Parallel Mothers comes out and Manual for a Cleaning Woman. Anyway. I hope so. So The Human Voice enjoyed a small theatrical release in March 2021 and will undoubtedly be available to stream soon. The opening credits note that it is freely based on Jean Cocteau's play, a 1930 work that Almodovar has referenced in his work before. So many times before. (laughs) Most notably in Law of Desire and Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, which in classic Almodovar fashion are also both referenced here. Really? I missed it. (laughs) The Human Voice is 30 minutes long and stars basically only Tilda Swinton. And it's Almodovar's first film in English, though it still seems to take place in Spain. And since it is only a half hour long, we're going to go ahead and discuss the ending, particularly since it's uh, the kind of ending that so utterly informs everything that came in beforehand, that you sort of have to rewatch the whole movie with the reveal in mind. So that's your spoiler warning. Daniel. What is The Human Voice about? The Human Voice is about an unnamed woman who is waiting at her apartment for her lover to come home, only to receive a phone call from him where he breaks up with her, causing her to spiral out of control. I have to say, this was a magical return to Almodovar land. I think after we had wrapped on our podcast about three months ago, I had not seen any more Almodovar movies. And to just have this return to this like magical, gorgeous place, it is populated by the world's most beautiful hardware store, the world's most beautiful dog, the world's most beautiful apartment, the world's most beautiful clothes. After a year or so of being stuck in my own house, it was just so transportive. Oh, the apartment, as always, made me want to kill myself. It's so beautiful. (laughs) The world's most beautiful gas canister. Oh my god. (laughs) I really loved the bathroom because it had all this beveled subway tile but it was vertical which is just like a beautiful idea to like flip it vertical and actually my old place in atlanta had beveled subway tile in it too and so i felt very attached to that i watching literally any pedro almodovar movie is sort of like wanting to torch your own house because of how ugly it is in comparison to what you just saw um what did you think of this movie this short I loved it. I I watched it a few times back to back because it was just so easy to go down. I felt like it was just a straight bump of Pedro Coke. <laughs> That's a really good way of describing this movie. It's like there's not a lot going on, but there's so much happening. And it's so dense, even though it's just Tilda monologuing with some AirPods. Yeah, she's like the whole movie is basically her talking, her sort of like waiting around for her boyfriend or whatever to come back home. And then she gets this call from him and she tells him that she's actually fine. She went to the theater. She did drugs. 
she got a call from her agent who said that they're still looking for actresses like her nowadays. Actresses her age are so hot right now. Yes. And then by the end of the movie, she basically confesses to him that like everything that she had said was actually a lie. And then she tortures her own place for a reason. And then she walks out with the dog. Which is, I think, a sort of, like, Border Collie or an Australian Shepherd. But, like, I'm sorry to everyone who has a dog that is not one of those two breeds. They are just, like, the most beautiful dogs. I feel like I have to, like, put that on the record. Like, there is no more beautiful dog. Anyway. So what did you think of it? I feel really torn because... Just like Natalie and Brulia. <laughs> yes, I was definitely on the floor trying to figure out like how I felt about this movie. So there's like 1000 parallels that you you could draw to women on the verge of a nervous breakdown. It sort of like roughly has the same plot. And I think that there is the recurring element of the sleeping pills of Peppa sort of like trying to destroy the bed that she shared with her boyfriend, Yvonne. Fire fire i think like they're both roughly in show business both couples are sort of like roughly in show business but the thing is that like so i think that i had read for our women on the verge of a nervous breakdown episode which i don't know if i had mentioned in that episode is that some feminists in spain got mad at the movie when it came out because they were like Oh, so, like, now you have this, like, modern woman and the plot of this movie about, like, a modern woman is about how all she can do is be obsessed over a man. And I kept wondering, Tilda Swinton here is basically stylized as Tilda. Like, she does this, like, very fun thing where she keeps changing her clothes throughout, like, three days. And all she's doing is, like, sitting in her apartment But one of the first ways that we see her is, like, in this, like, incredibly stylish, incredibly androgynous blue suit. So she sort of styled the way that, like, we generally tend to think of Tilda Swinton, right? As this, like, really, like, self-sufficient, independent woman. And basically, my mind kept going, like... Like, on the one hand, of course, she's, like, an actress. But on the other hand, I'm really supposed to buy, like, both the Tilda vibe and marry that to this female desperation and longing for a man. Because I think, like, it didn't quite cohere together for me. And so it sort of, like, made the rest of the movie a little bit harder to swallow. I think that if you have this, like, sort of, like hyper femininity that he's really into playing with that kind of like pining for a man is like sort of like a little bit more in line I guess I don't know like I feel like this didn't bother you it didn't I uh actually really enjoyed Tilda in this film I was surprised I would because going into it and thinking about it I was like oh this is just like I'm not going to be able to see past Tilda Swinton and see this as a movie. Uh, I'm just going to be thinking about Tilda doing things. And there was a certain amount of that. But I think that what you're talking about, how her like androgyny and Tilda Swinton-ness kind of takes away from the femininity you tend to associate with the type of like lover obsession, yeah. actually kind of sold it for me because it's all a part of this structure of artifice that he loves to play with and that like by putting her in this very feminized role he's kind of almost like calling more attention to it because she doesn't necessarily fit and yet she's such a talented actress that like all of the monologue is so easily bought at least for me I bought everything she was saying I never felt like she was acting i just felt like she was being so like her appearance really was the pulling me out of it type of appearance but it worked because everything visual kind and in this film and we'll get into that kind of pulls you out of the experience in an intentional way i think yeah i think one of the first things that you definitely notice about this space that she is in is the entire movie takes place on a soundstage. And within the soundstage is her apartment. And so Almodovar wants to let you know that 
this entire apartment as beautiful as it is, is essentially a stage. And there was something really similar to that with Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, where every time you looked into the larger cityscape, it looked really fake on purpose. And I think with Women on the Verge, it was sort of to call attention to how at least in my reading of it, how like basically the rest of the city like doesn't matter to her, the world doesn't matter to her because she's so consumed by this heartbreak. And I think here, like the artifice, the artifice that's like really foregrounded has a kind of different effect, even though she has like this exact same, like very lush uh, garden-ish terrace that Peppa does. I think that the artifice here is sort of to try to like point out how like, ridiculous, like, the entire situation is, even though, at the same time, Amadovar really wants you to feel the plight of this woman. This might be one of those, like, really rare situations for me, where the aesthetics and the heartbreak sort of, like, work against each other instead of in tandem. And so, I really liked looking at it, but I don't know if I really was able to lose myself in it, partly because he keeps like taking you out of it at the same time yeah like we get get, like overhead shots that show the like top of the home structure so you can kind of see the different rooms with the like plywood and stuff connecting them and everything but i i actually appreciated that and liked kind of being pulled out of it at times because i and also this is just because like i'm a much more gullible person than you are i think so like i so easily got sucked into the experience that Tilda's character was having so that like those moments of pullback was like oh this is a movie this is a set this is a thing that I'm watching that isn't real in any sense and yet the feelings still are real to me and especially at the end as she's like in her final phone call with him and we don't need to get there yet but like that and them and her like leaving with the dog really kind of sold the whole movie for me, I think. I think going back to the comparison between Peppa and Tilda, the other reason why I was a little like, ooh, about Tilda's casting specifically is that I think that kind of like, I don't know, maybe this is like ageist on my part, but I feel like the Peppa yearning and like going crazy sort of like made a little bit more sense for someone in their 20s as opposed to someone who seems to be in their 50s. Not to say that women in their 50s can't also like lose themselves in love. But I kind of felt like this unnamed character was so much sadder than I think what the human voice wanted me to feel. For example, Peppa has friends. Peppa has Candela. At the end of the movie, Peppa ends up with basically like a child to raise. And so Peppa has a full life. And Tilda's character basically ends up at the end of the movie with like a dog that like even she says prefers like her ex-boyfriend to her and she says like drugs are like basically like my only friends and I was like oh so like this isn't like a happy ending even though like she gets all of these cute moments with her dog this is like a woman who like probably really actually needs some sort of like intervention I feel like putting that much realism on any type of Pedro Almodovar movie is <laughs> a fool's errand, but I definitely think that she is clearly sadder in that way. But to me, I think that this obsession that she has works with her age and with Peppa's age because like if she's like in her 50s and this is like maybe a relationship that she was hoping would be like her last one, then like now she has to kind of start all over again. And that could be scary for someone in their middle age as opposed to young and still like out on the town. And so I understood the desperation, but... I think I'm just like a little bit thrown off because I read an interview with Amadovar in Vulture done by my former co-worker Rachel Handler, shout out. And basically he said that this was one of the happiest endings that he had ever done. And I'm just like... Is it though? See, like you're making a face. So like, I know that like, I'm not off in this. I mean, I'm thinking about the endings of all of his movies and none of them are great. (laughs) But I think you might want to rephrase as in like, oh, none of them are positive. (laughs) But 
I don't think that this is the most hopeful. I don't think this is the ha- no. like, the best ending. No, like this is a sad lady, and it's like fine to be a sad lady. Just like don't tell me that like she's not a sad lady. Though I do find burning your entire life down invigorating in a way. So maybe she is now given a new energy from the flames of she's rising rising from the ashes like a phoenix like ben affleck after his divorce exactly she's gonna go get a back tattoo (laughs) honestly if tilda swinton doesn't have a back tattoo i would be disappointed i also really loved the uh opening scene we see her standing behind a screen in this like big red dress that uh, has like a huge hoop skirt which reminded me a lot of pain and glory for some reason it reminded me a lot of Salvador's one-man play that Alberto put on uh, with the like screen and the red and everything. And then you see her in this black dress and what look like those Vibram five-finger toe shoes, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. And I was like, oh, God, what is this? But then you find out that they're high heels. And I was like, okay, now, <laughs> now I'm into this. I think the outfit I couldn't get over is she has this like cashmere two piece where it's like a cashmere like red sweater and then like matching cashmere pants. And of course, it's in all red. And then there's like a point where she gets into the shower with the cashmere on to like wash her hair and she does not bother taking her clothes off. And I was like, what are you doing? That costs five thousand dollars. Well, I think that Two things about that, actually. One is that that is a direct reference to Law of Desire, where Carmen Maura's character gets drenched in the water as she's wearing a sweater dress. Hmm. That's what I was reminded of. But also, I think that this outfit costs $5,000. This is a short that he made. It is not a full-length film. It is not getting released in like a large theatrical release. This is like a personal passion project that I feel like is just a moment for Pedro to say like, fuck it, I'm old. I'm spending all the money I have. Who cares? (laughs) Because I'm reminded of like... There's no way that like he did not get that outfit for free in some way. No, but what I mean is that like I'm reminded that when we talked about Women on the Verge of Nervous Breakdown, you told me that uh, apparently the set was so expensive that they reused a lot of it for Time Me Up, Time Me Down just to justify having spent that much money on it. Yeah. And now he's like, well, fuck it. I have so much money now and have so much acclaim that like I can build this entire opulent set full of beautiful furniture and statement pieces and then just burn it all down because I have the money. Yeah, exactly. It's such a power move. I love it. So this short is called The Human Voice. And it's basically about a woman who is being dumped in sort of like the most brutal way possible. And I think like well, one of no, the... Well, no, the most brutal way possible would be over text. If she had just gotten a text and then spiraled out all in her own. But anyway. That's yeah. exactly like what I was trying to say. Where at this point in technology, I don't think that like this is the most brutal way for someone to be dumped after a four-year relationship. And so I understand that, like, in order to, like, have the premise of, like, someone sort of, like, spiraling out on the phone, you need to have that. But I also sort of feel like it doesn't quite match. I know you've never seen Sex and the City, but, like, when the Post-it episode came out, like, 15 years ago, where Carrie gets dumped, like, via Post-it, that was supposed to be sort of this, like, new low in, like, how men could treat women. And now I feel like it's even worse where it would be over text or like just simply ghosting someone like through unfollows. Yeah, like she would come back from the hardware store and the apartment would be empty of his things. Because he hired like a task rabbit or something. Exactly. Yeah, I know that like we sort of need the premise of this phone call, but it also like doesn't quite have the same impact of like how impersonally someone could be broken up with. I think there's... It's possible I'm sort of like overthinking all of this, but it just sort of, there's a bunch of like little things that like all add up to my not having enjoyed this as much as I wish I had. I got to agree with you there on the modern technology of, of it all, because there's just something lost when instead of it being a physical ringing telephone that you have to pick up the receiver for and hold it to your ear, and it's something you can slam down and have like a 
decisive moment with. I so miss that era when you were able to slam down a phone handle. Like, I miss that so much. Even just like having a flip phone to be able to flip it closed. Like, there's no more physicality left to like the hang up in a way that is satisfying. And that's why it was comical in a way that I don't think was intentional when she hangs up on him by throwing her AirPods to the ground followed by her phone. Like, that was just <laughs> a dumb, funny moment as and was not in any way, like, artistic or satisfying. It was just, like, dumb. Yeah. And I think our previous guest, June, had talked to us about how he keeps reenacting these, like, same scenarios. But the technology in those scenarios have sort of passed him by and I think watching the short that was one of the ways that I really felt that where I was just like I think it's amazing she even got a phone call so like maybe like Jose isn't even that bad yeah he's actually (laughs) one of the better guys it seems yeah I was like this is like way better than Yvonne Mm mm-hmm I was genuinely surprised that they the airpods were not like Dolce & Gabbana limited edition AirPods that were like stylishly colored or something. That was the one moment where I was like, I could have used a little more Pedro touch there, especially because they are so like weirdly of the time in a way that like none of his work ever really feels that way. And also that whole apartment is full of like probably limited edition designer everything. No question. Even when Tilda is like taking her like mini overdose of pills, like the color of the pills are like basically a little like museum artwork bursts of color. Yeah, I definitely feel you with the AirPods where I was just sort of like, I get that like you're trying to signal that like we're in a contemporary period and everything. But it was just like another thing where it sort of like took me a little bit too much outside of the world of the movie. Yeah, but um, one thing that I did mean to mention when we were talking about the artificiality of the apartment that I'm reminded of is one bit of business that I really loved was when Tilda was making coffee and she tries to open two of the drawers next to the coffee maker, but they won't open because they're just dummy drawers because this is a set. And so there is one drawer that works, (laughs) of course, but like those don't work because it would be inefficient to build drawers that work there. So I just loved that as like a little piece of like theater business. So yeah, that's a reading I hadn't considered. That's really funny. So early in the movie, the only time that we exist outside of the apartment in the soundstage is when she goes to a hardware store. The world's most beautiful hardware store. And it's staffed by Agustin. Agustin. Which you finally noticed. You finally you finally noticed him for <laughs> once, Ingu. Good job. And the other person working at the hardware store who's kind of in the background is Carlos Garcia Cambero, who to me seems like one of the most common Pedro actors in all of his work and yet never has more than like two lines, it seems. But he's the telephone repairman in Women on the Verge of Nervous Breakdown. Oh. He's in everything as just like the smallest bit character. And I still don't know how he fits into Pedro's real life, but it feels like he has to in some way because of how much he recurs just like Augustine. We will get to the bottom of this one day. But yeah, it's, so it's like these two men that just pop up in every single Pedro movie, it seems, and then Tilda Swinton. I love that she, there is like a scene where what she does is just go pick out an axe. Like, I have no use for an axe, but the whole act was so beautiful. Like, I immediately wanted to go and (laughs) buy my own axe. And also, the hardware store visit, even though it takes, like, I don't know, 10 seconds or whatever, gives us this beautiful uh, credit sequence where you see a film by Pedro Amadovar and then the human voice and Tilda Swinton's name written out in the various hardware tools. It's a very mask title sequence. Yes, the bright green and the bright colors definitely scream mask for mask. Um. <laughs> well, they do to Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I that and then um, Alberto Iglesias very like violin like Hitchcockian score just like took me back so quickly to breathing that like Almodovarian air that like I had not breathed in three months and I was just like oh I'm home um one thing that was definitely very Almodovar-esque 
is that at the very beginning of the film, you see Tilda Swinton's character organizing a bunch of her books and DVDs. And I just had to like write them all down because... Oh, same. Of course. <laughs> I got Written in the Wind, Music for Chameleons, which is a Truman Capote book. Kill Bill, Breakfast at Tiffany's, another Truman Capote book. All That Heaven Allows, Shoplifters, Jackie, Phantom Thread. So like a mix of like mid-century melodramas and then like more recent films. I did clock Kill Bill and Phantom Thread as probably sort of like contrasts to Tilda Swinton's character in the same way that like in Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, you get like this little snippet of Joan Crawford in Johnny Guitar and that sort of hyper masculine frontier woman is sort of supposed to be like a contrast to Peppa. And I feel like the way that in The Phantom Thread and Kill Bill, you get these like vengeful women it's probably meant to be a kind of contrast to Tilda Swinton's character. Well, but I also think that while they are contrasts, they're also still studies in obsession. Oh, yeah, I can see that of monomania. Exactly. And I think that actually, there are a few other books that we see, but I think that um, Other Men's Daughters, which is in Spanish on the table, but is an uh, English book, is also something like that. It's about like a professor and a student. So kind of, in some ways, the same thing, uh, or related to that romantic obsession. I also think it's funny that uh, one book that popped up is a manual for cleaning women, which is just a project that he's working on after his next one, Parallel Mothers. Uh, And it's just funny, because like, he's always throwing in references to the next thing he's going to do, or the next thing he's thinking about. So of course, he had to have that in the pile as well. You know what I would honestly love to watch? The only person I would trust with a Breakfast at Tiffany's adaptation would be Pedro Almodovar. Oh my god. I I would love that. Because I feel like the Audrey Hepburn movie is such a absolute bastardization of the book and brief digression. One of the things that like I truly hate about the Breakfast at Tiffany's movie is that it took a book a novella that is like basically about like a friendship between a woman and a gay man and basically like made it into a heterosexual romance which I'm sorry like fuck off and I really want to watch Pedro Almodovar's version of Holly Golightly who is like a perfect Almodovar heroine Although I think like maybe the person who gets like closest to that is actually probably Kika. Um, Ugh, just that Kika. same kind of like ditzy character who like gets into like something much bigger than she realizes. And then it's like, oh, shit. Kika, his most camp film. <laughs> we'll talk about Kika in one of the bonus episodes. We sure will. Um, one other film of his that I was reminded of while watching this As I said before, when talking about him having to use the set again in Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down from Women on the Verge just to be able to justify the price of it, is that like the whole living on a set in some way reminded me of Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down because of that like extended amount of time they spent in the filming location that is like an actual house and everything that the movie is taking place in. And that it's like this artificial location that is also a place. And so I was just really reminded of that movie too. I think this is really referencing like a lot of the films he made in his prime. Yeah, it's very interesting to me that he keeps doing these like reiterations of Woman on the Verge, which I think sort of like just gets closer and closer to me as sort of like the Ur Almodovar film. I'm still not over the fact that, like, in Broken Embraces, he, like, remakes, like, a really shitty version of that and then sort of, like, claims that, like, the Penelope Cruz version in that movie is, like, better somehow than, like, the actual movie, which is absolute nonsense. And then here again, it's very interesting. I think it's, like, a thought experiment to see, like, if you added this, like, other very different type of character in Peppa's place, like, how does that play, especially in 2021 versus, like, 1988 or whatever. And so it's very fascinating to me that he keeps returning to this. I just don't think that it's 
recapturing lightning in the bottle. I don't think he is either, but I think he has captured something new here and interesting that I really loved. And it does have a lot of the DNA of his older work. But I'm also thinking about like his whole schism with Carmen Maura at the end of uh, Women on the Verge of Nervous Breakdown and how like their relationship ended for almost 20 years because his next film was for a younger actress. And that like now this is him making something that would have been a Carmen Maura type vehicle. Well, she's like in her 70s, right? Well, no, but I mean like he's now making this thing with an actress the age that she kind of would have been sliding into after Women on the Verge that like he abandoned because he didn't want to, I don't know if he didn't want to or wasn't interested in pursuing the aging actress as much as he seems to now. Speaking of aging actresses, I apparently like all of those lines that seem extremely swintony. Like when she says the women of my age are in fashion again, apparently people like my pallor, my mixture of madness and melancholy. According to Amadovar, he wrote those lines like thinking of a Swinton-esque actor, but not like her specifically. And then I think at some point she calls herself like a ruin of her former self. And it just was like one more reminder, I guess, of like me wishing that he just sort of had like something more interesting to say about like aging women or whatever, other than like, oh, I'm not as beautiful as I used to be. I feel like there's like a whole school of like film directors who can basically only conceive of making movies about older women if they're basically like aging actresses who are fretting over their looks. And it's if they so- are Uma Rojo. Yes, and, like, those movies are so boring, and something like All About My Mother is so fun because, like, Uma's not, like, hanging around, like, crying about, like, how fewer wrinkles she used to have or whatever. And I do think that, like, there's, like, a fun irony in Swinton's character, like, sort of making fun of herself and, like, her place in the market. But... If you were going to, like, bring in the whole, like, aging actress trope, I wish he had just done something a little bit more interesting with that. Yeah, I think that as he's gotten older, and especially thinking about Pain and Glory, he's so good at capturing the older man. Mm -hmm. And it feels like he's still stuck in the same recursive thinking of womanhood and hasn't moved past that in a way that he has as a man because he's aged as that and has had to live with it in a way that he's still like women to him are an idea still yeah i would watch parallel grandmothers that would be great speaking of dialogue though i did want to point out two things one is the one line of pedro speak in the film which is when i'm crazy about someone i lose my sense of humor (laughs) i also clock that as probable pedro speak (laughs) and also just like thinking about that and thinking about his films my brain immediately went to Bad Education, which is like such an unfunny film in a way, even though it is like a beautiful, wonderful, great work of his, one of his masterpieces. But like, it does lack some sort of like that humor, I think, at like important times. And it's because it is so involved with this like, very deeply personal obsession, I think that he had. Yeah, it's like a deeper exploration that like, I don't know, I guess. uh, I mean, on the one hand, my first thought was, why would you want to introduce humor to a movie about sexual assault? And then I remember that that's <laughs> literally what he did with Kika. So <laughs> hey, Kika's great. Let's calm down about Kika. No, um, I also really enjoyed Kika so much more than I ever thought I would. Yeah. The other line that I wanted to point out is where Tilda says, the rules of the game, the law of desire. Oh, Yeah. That was... <laughs> and I laughed. I actually laughed. <laughs> some of the dialogue in this, like... Well, some of it felt clearly like this is just directly pulled from the play. Mm-hmm. And I think that in some ways hurt it, actually, because mm-hmm. it felt like a little, not of stilted. its time, but like stilted, like very, like this is a stage play piece of dialogue. But I will say, having watched like a stage production of this on YouTube of The Human Voice... Cocteau's play while we were recording and producing last fall I hated it I found Mm -hmm. it like interminable insufferable and I loved it here and I think 
a lot of that is just the Pedro magic of it all that like Almodovar can bring such like life to most anything he works on. Then I think that like also because he's been so obsessed with this play for so long, I would hope that it paid off in some way. It'd be really disappointing if like this thing that he had been obsessed with for Check's Watch 40 years of his life, he just did a bad job. Like that would have been very funny, but very, very sad. <laughs> <laughs> but now I think we should talk about the end. Because you okay. seemed you seemed uh, really, the way that you framed the end at the top, I was like, oh, I, I didn't realize it was that revelatory, but I would love to hear your take on it. I mean, when she admits that she had been basically lying to him the entire time, that basically oh, also means yeah. that by the end of the movie, we realize that everything that we had heard is basically a lie. And so I saw this movie twice, and the second time I definitely went in with like, a kind of eye toward, you know how like sometimes like actors do dual simultaneous performances based on like whether their character is like good or like bad pretending to be good or whatever. And I don't think that like there was anything like that really, uh, but it definitely cast all of her actions just like being stuck in her house uh, in a new light. And then, yeah, like to me, it's, like the whole thing seemed much sadder. The fact that, like, she couldn't even operate in her own kitchen because she was so distraught. Yeah, well, and that distraught feeling drives her to burn her house down, burn her apartment down in this soundstage, which is such a beautiful but also unsurprising image, I feel like, from Almodovar at this point because he loves, uh, specifically referencing women on the verge, love setting things on fire, Peppa burning all of Yvonne's clothes on the bed, which is just such a, and her just watching it burn until she starts coughing is such a vivid piece of film that it was refreshing and exciting to see it happen here. And actually, even that the mirroring started even before that, where Tilda's character grabs the gas can and then starts watering the flowers with it. And at first I was like, wait, is this just a gas can that looks like, like, is this a water can that looks like a gas can? Because I love that. But then when you find it like, oh, no, this is an actual gas can and she's burning the whole house down. It's exciting. And I think that it's an interesting flip of what Peppa's doing in Women on the Verge, where she's watering all of her like lush flowers and gardens and everything. She's nurturing. Yes, as a way to nurture and as a way to cope. And that Tilda's way to do that, maybe because she has nothing left to nurture in this house in this relationship she just nurtures by burning it down by just raising the ground oh she still has a dog right right but like it's not the same it doesn't have the same register and i think it doesn't have that like same note of satisfaction i guess i don't know i don't know what to do with this and maybe you have an opinion on it but like the final shot of her or the final like series of scenes as she's like shaking the gasoline all over the back of the set to burn down the set apartment. She's in the ugliest outfit of the entire movie. <laughs> I did not notice this. It's just like a garish collection of clothes that do not fit together and are no longer the oh, like, yeah. monochromatic like palette that she's been going with. And it's now she's like, she has these black platforms and these like shimmery black flowing pants and a like... It's like a weird hodgepodge of clothes that don't yeah. go together. But yeah, it was just like funny that she kind of... I don't know if she's trying to just abandon the rigidity of the wardrobe that she's been in before this. And now she's kind of like breaking free by like throwing on this leather jacket and this like, like tying a plaid like button down around her waist and just kind of like fully changing her energy just through the clothes she was wearing from the past scenes. I feel like that was supposed to be an indication that she was no longer waiting for Jose because she says previously that she had like put on makeup even though she wasn't leaving the house and she kept changing her clothes I guess to impress him because she really wanted him to like return and like find her looking really ravishing. And I guess she was finally like, eh, like, who am I dressing up for? She finally like got down with like the current logic of it all. Yeah. And then he like is on the phone as she is just setting fire to the whole home that they've had together as the like final moment. And making him watch. Yes. Oh, I loved that. <laughs> I'm what's burning, my love. 
it's that was a beautiful moment. And if only she had had a phone receiver to slam down instead of some AirPods that she threw on the floor. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad I saw this movie. I don't think it quite worked for me, but I also feel very much like this is the kind of thing where it's so short and so specific and so very much a product of its time, meaning Corona that I think that if I rewatch this in like two years and definitely like rewatch this in like five or ten years, I can definitely see having a like a really different reaction to it. So listeners, look out for that episode in ten years time. (laughs) So I guess in lieu of our usual ranking system, because that doesn't really make sense here, would you recommend this? And I think that, yeah, I would recommend it. I don't think it like really quite coheres, at least for me. But I, th- it's so beautiful. I think the price of admission is like worth it alone just for that opening sequence. And it's so visually pornographic, really, like it's so beautiful, that I don't know why you would why anyone would deny themselves uh, that experience. What about you, Daniel? Yeah, I mean, I I loved luxuriating in the stylishness of this film. It was such a satisfying dip into his overly stylized mind. But I don't think I would recommend this if you hadn't seen any of the movies that it's referencing. Really? Do you feel like you have to watch Woman on the Verge before this? It's not that I don't think you'd understand what's going on or that like you wouldn't get something out of it. I just think that it is so heavily influenced by... Women on the Verge, by Law of Desire, by his just past films that he's made, that a lot of it would be lost. And that's not to say that you wouldn't get a great experience from watching this. If you are going to sit down and watch it with somebody who hasn't seen any of those movies, then like, great, that's fine. But to get the full effect, but to get the full effect and to fully appreciate the artistry that's at work. And also to maybe, I don't want to say be willing to, but like, to appreciate the extent of his artifice, I think there needs to be some sort of understanding of his work in artificiality before this movie. Otherwise, it feels a bit too far afield. This is exactly like when I told you that you are not allowed to watch Pain and Glory until you had watched 10 Almodovar movies beforehand. So now the student has become the master. There are worse ways to be introduced to Almodovar than this quick 30-minute hit, and I think if you watch it and it does anything for you, you will immediately want to run to any of his other movies except for The Skin I Live In. (laughs) And I hope that that's what this does for people who haven't seen his works before or who are listening to this and haven't watched this yet, is like, this is just something that reinvigorates Almodovar passion. Yeah. And that's what I would want it to do for anybody listening. I guess that's our ninth episode. If you have questions or comments, please email us at allaboutalmodovar at gmail.com. This is Ingo King. This is Daniel Schrader. And we'll see you next time. I had to flip my breaker to turn my fridge off again.